Thank you, everybody, for joining us again. It's your boy, Norn Red 89 here with my buddy, Steve, and you know what that means. We are here to go back to nowhere, and we're going to be tackling now Season 2 of Courage the Cowardly Dog. How are you feeling, Steve? You ready to do this next season? Ready to dive on in, and I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I took off with nowhere to land. <laughs> I'm ready to go. It's yes, going to be excited. interesting, though. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know this is fun because now we're on season two. So now we get to see if there's any ones that we remember, if there's any new reoccurring characters or anything like that. So it's going to be a lot of fun. So let's kind of dive in right now. Huh? Episode one with our first segment, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about the magic tree of nowhere. A wish granting tree grows by the farmhouse. Envious of all the attention it gets from his family, Eustace decides to chop it down. So how did you feel about this first episode of season two, Steve? It was a cute one. Um, you know, very similar um, to sort of a lot of the past episodes. This this feel like I feel like this one focused a lot on Eustace and Courage's relationship and perspective. And like clearly, obviously, is it as you said in the synopsis? you know, focusing on Eustace's, uh, like, jealousy. His envy and his jealousy. Courage, you know. <laughs> uh, and, well, now, I guess, shifting over to this tree. So the tree by proxy being courage. Um, yeah. And we get some weird animation in this one, too, which is always fun. Oh, yeah, that was kind of creepy. The tree, kind of, like, just the animation and maybe the color and, like, the the human kind of mouth that they had going on with it. It just reminded me of... um like the the power rangers like the the one who gives them all their missions and stuff you know and the, like yeah it just kind of reminded me of that like the look of it even the presence that the tree had it kind of had that feeling almost the zordon was a tree you know and <laughs> the multiverse of storytelling maybe there will maybe we'll get that one day on power rangers <laughs> side of things and um, it was kind of interesting too that we have was it muriel and courage kind of falling for the tree you know kind of really you know enjoying the wish factor of this tree and being able to get whatever they want almost you know <laughs> yeah i love that sort of yeah this like mad well they get like these magic seeds in the mail um and they come with the oven is that yeah. what it was? Or they get the oven from the I no they get the oven from there she's that's her first wish yeah she wishes first for wish a new oven. oven that's right because the oven yeah. crapped out on that ranch <laughs> um this like high-tech oven <laughs> thing <Yo. laughs> um but yeah no i love the yeah these seeds it was, it was almost very like um uh jack and the beanstalk kind of thing yeah. i don't know not exactly because they didn't like trade a cow or something for it. I don't know, but I was almost getting like a Jack and the Beanstalk sort of vibes from it. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, no, I sort of I love the dynamic, and uh, the we get the return of the Doctor in this episode too. Oh, yep, yeah, that was cute. Yeah, we get the Doctor. <laughs> I had to put on the subtitles because I couldn't at first uh, on first watch I couldn't tell what he diagnosed her with. Yeah, you could, just, oh yeah. What did he, what did he say? It's bully, bully, like bully, bully, bully. like bull, getting bullied. Yeah, like bully, bully. Yeah, just bully, bully. bully. <laughs> Is that a thing? I don't know. And he was just like, "There's, she'll be all right. There's no cure." But there's, or he's like, "It's okay, but there's no cure." <laughs> there's no, I can't do anything for you, but there's no cure. <laughs> Uh, or no, you're, but you're gonna be okay. I don't know. Yeah. It was very funny. I love the doctor. Just never knows what's going on. Um, you can't really trust, and, and that's actually it's funny enough. It, um, but if whether it's doctors or the police or anyone in like a, a, a place of authority or someone that's like they don't know what they're doing in these three episodes that we watched, it actually came oh, no. up a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, we've had that like with people who pilot planes or anything like that. Yeah, these people they're ready, they don't know how what they're doing, or they're ready to give up real quick and just leave courage to handle everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what did what did you think about sort of the middle section of the episode where um courage is trying to protect the tree i thought that was cute is when he found out that he needed the tree and then eustace the whole time just with the axe like that was actually kind of cool like i lot like just how eustace was sharpening it and then like the look of it and him trying to go at the tree and then like the sand castle and everything it had that that was very much like a looney tunes type comedy going mm -hmm. on with that slapsticky stuff but i really liked it i thought it was really cute between both of them so that was a fun part <laughs> yeah i mean i yeah him digging the moat around the tree building this castle and then putting an instant eel in the moat was really funny yeah. this this irish <laughs> and he sang. danny boy <laughs> I don't, 
so yeah this one was kind of all over the place like it was it was really all over the place it had a little bit of fantasy we mm -hmm. had a little bit of you know comedy but also some horror so it was, it was kind of crazy yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, yeah. So I guess the, the cure comes from the tree. So yeah. I, I guess like what I liked is sort of the big irony of this episode. Um, it almost had little elements of the giving tree in it. Um, where I was thinking it was like, okay, so he you know uses cuts down the tree, um, so courage is able to take the flowers, the flowers that had a chance to grow, mix it with honey, cure Muriel, but then Eustace gets bully, bully. But because he cut down the tree, now he doesn't have the cure. <laughs> so, you know, his envy being his own foil, right? Um, yeah. But what was no... it? Wasp honey, right? Hornets honey or wasp honey or something? Honey, which I didn't know yeah, hornets but... made honey. <laughs> <laughs> but just bees made honey. I don't know. Um, but yeah, no, I love that. Well, just like a little ironic ending um, for Eustace. Uh, sort of the literally reap what you sow kind of thing, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but then, but there's, I guess there's hope because there was one flower growing off the stump. So maybe the tree comes back. I don't know. I know. That was so hopeful. I thought that was cute. It'd be cool if like in later episodes in season two, we see like the tree just in the background, just like as part of their yeah. background. Like it's there. It's the one tree that grows in nowhere all the time. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I, you know, I think um, I remember reading that this was the first appearance of the instant eel, which I guess by, by, by saying first appearance, I'm assuming that the eel comes back and that also said yeah. the first appearance of the tree. So I'm assuming that we're, we are, yes, we are going to see the tree again at some point. Yeah. Uh, in what capacity? I'm not sure. We'll see. Now on to, on to segment two now, Steve. We want to introduce yeah. our next segment. So episode one, part two, is Robot Randy. Uh, conforming to his race's whims, a giant robot named Randy reluctantly travels to Earth and enslaves Courage and his owners in order to prove to his people that he is not a failure. Uh, I actually loved this episode. This segment specifically. I think this might be my favorite out of the um, six segments that we're going to talk about. Uh, yeah. Randy, aka Christopher Walken. Christopher Walken, for yep. For some reason, <laughs> <laughs> they gave Randy a Christopher Walken impression. Um, he doesn't want to destroy things like the other robots. Uh, yeah. But he gets sent to Earth to um, overtake it, you know, destroy and conquer. Yeah, to enslave Earth. Yeah, conquer Earth. Um, They're like, that's your job. And he yeah. just doesn't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think about Randy? I thought it was really cute. Like even like how he's just he's a little bit different colored, his design and mm -hmm. everything. He's a little different colored than all the robots. The the voice is just a classic, like really call back to because Christopher Walken's probably one of those just like almost the Sean Connery thing. <clears throat> you know, it's like, oh, that's a very specific accent, you know, kind of thing mm -hmm. that they have going on. So I thought it was kind of funny to have the Christopher Walken thing. And then yeah. it was cute, you know, how he came in and he had the them trying to build stuff, right? They were building like monuments and statues and all this stuff. <laughs> yeah, trying to worship this robot, right? So they're slaving <laughs> away. Um, and then there was a moment where they're chipping away at rocks. Or no, they're in the mud puddle. And they're like, you know, Eustace is like flinging mud at Courage. At Courage. Um, and then Muriel's like, you know, come on, Eustace. Isn't life hard enough? And he's like, well, not hard enough for the dog. I was like, you jerk. <laughs> for real. <laughs> you know, never it, stops. <laughs> no, no. He always like, it, like he, if everything's bad for everyone, it's got to be worse for the dog. Like, you know, he can't be on the same level as Courage. Like they can't, there's no humbling allowed. <laughs> no equality allowed between the two which is funny because they're both they're all trying to be enslaved by this um or they're the robots trying to enslave them so it's sort of all these tiers of um i don't know it's like this class system within the episode yeah the class is on. yeah kind of focusing on who's on top and then the lower class but yeah but i love it this is another episode where we get um you know where the villain is taken down just by listening to them or like appealing to like their inner like truth yeah so that's what it's like a lot of these episodes we end up finding out that the eventual like said the third act resolution is something that's more like you said either humbling a truth thing or a misunderstanding so it becomes something that's not really like a negative thing they have a lot of positive stuff to say yeah rob um yeah uh randy the robot just wants to carve reindeer yeah, you know, so <laughs> there's so many reindeer too. Like he was really good at it. And there's just very one specific design reindeer. That was it. He just wanted to <laughs> carve those reindeer. Um, it is the one that he named in the episode was Ivana. 
I just like Ivana the reindeer. It was adorable. <laughs> um, but yeah, they appeal to like his inner truth, his you know his inner desire of just wanting to be this like reindeer whittler. Um, and so he's like, all right, no, I don't have to conquer worlds. I can just do this thing. Oh yeah, because that's that's what people want. To be honest, like I've t- talked to so many people, and it's like when you find that thing that's you, that's something that's not necessarily like you said a job. It's just something that's mm-hmm. straight up you, and it's a part of you. It's like yeah. it, it very much represents who you are. <laughs> yeah, and it's not like what people tell you you want to be or you should be, right? It's uh, what you want. Um, but it was sweet, you know, him going back to uh, his planet um, and just showing off these reindeer, and then actually being appreciated for it. Um, and he's not seen as a failure, except for that one robot at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, forget. Who's like, can you carve something else? And then he like blows yep. him up. <laughs> I love it. Not you know, not again, not a really heavy horror episode, but um, you know, definitely, obviously, more sci-fi here. Yeah, yeah, more science fiction. Yeah, like definitely old sci-fi theater, like you know, kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was trying to think like if the robots, you know, um. Uh, were modeled. I don't know if it was was that uh, Robbie the robot um, had a little bit of that vibe to it. I think it's Robbie the robot. Um, Are we thinking from was that Lost in Space or was that uh, Battlestar uh, Galactica? What was that? Robbie is from actually a few things. Forbidden Planet originally. Forbidden Planet, okay, but I think Robbie shows up um, in like other things too. Okay, like that that model gets used. Nice. Um, yeah, so I, I'm assuming Randy the robot, Randy, Robbie, I think they were a little bit based off to Forbidden Planet here, <laughs> which is which I appreciate. Nice, yeah. Anything else on little Robbie, Randy? Ooh, Not Randy. Robbie. No, Randy. <laughs> <laughs> no, we could go to the next one if you want. We have a reoccurring guest coming back now for our next yeah. episode, right? Huh? Yes, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Clear my throat. Sorry. We have the curse of Shirley as a result of Eustace's cruelty and ang- an, an, an angry Shirley lays a rain thunder cloud curse upon him. So we have Shirley coming back. One of my favorites from last season. How, what did you think of having her come back, Steve? I, I okay, Yeah, I love having recurring characters and it helps build out the world. Surprised that no one recognized her. Yeah, they did treat her like a stranger. (laughs) They sort of just treated her like a stranger. They're like, well, you, you know. Um, He helped us last year, but I guess, you know, whatever. Clean slate this time around. Unless maybe she'll wipe their memory. I don't know. (laughs) But it was like sort of like a classic, um, like, help help the witch, help the the wandering soul kind of story, right? Yeah. Um, You know, where Muriel and Courage, I mean, she puts the pressure on them to help, but they do it. Um, yeah, and then of course Eustace is like, no, get out of here. Yeah, it almost gave me to like just the whole curse and her presence and the vibes of almost like uh, Stephen King's Thinner. Like it had that mm-hmm. kind of vibe to it a little bit. And I like how Shirley had the was it the jazz like how she played the song. She was playing the little jazz theme little song she had yeah. going on. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, this came out after Courage, but I mean, I was even thinking like, yeah, like Drag Me to Hell. Um, yeah, you know, obviously not as. <laughs> Intense as that one, or as intense as thinner. That um, is a fun one, though. But, but used to see yeah, with the rain cloud. What did you think of his uh, his whole depression and him walking around refusing to believe in the curse? Well, I mean, really look at the metaphor there, right? It's like people don't see themselves as the problem, right? People often, and it's like such an obvious flaw, like you know, like his lack of generosity you know as a metaphorically but then literally becoming this cloud that hangs over him that keeps people away from him right yeah. because people are like you know you're getting us wet in the movie theater you're like ruining what you know it keeps people away from you it keeps you from like connecting right when you are that yeah. crappy of a person right um so i really do love this metaphor right and then all while he's refusing a birthday party that they're trying to throw him. Like they're trying to do something nice yes. for you, you jerk. But you and you're refusing, right? Like and and like she invited his mom. She, Mariel never wants to hang out with his mom. Yeah. And Eustace's mom is there. She actually invited him for his birthday, you know. <laughs> you know what's really funny? You mentioned the mom too. Um, I mean, obviously, yeah, she showed up in the episode, but there was the old lady that he refused to help cross the street or whatever. 
um, who I thought was the mom for a second because it, right? had, it, it had the head. It was the same face design. Yeah, she just had a bandana thing on there, like yeah. a like a little cloak bandana. <laughs> I was like, is he gonna like you know be rude to his mother? That'd be weird, <laughs> or like or be rude to this person, not realizing it's his mom, and then I didn't know what was gonna happen. But yeah, he like refuses this old lady. He refuses to help. <laughs> this guy getting eaten by a tentacle monster in the in the alley. Which was, <laughs> that was funny. That was hilarious. Yeah, yeah. And then he, I forget, he loses. His, is it his glasses get destroyed, or he loses yeah. them? Right. Yeah, because then he can't see, and then he starts seeing like Mariel is a villain and stuff like that. And then Courage has to finally go to Shirley to find out the solution, which she gives him that mirror, remember, like the mirror, so he could kind of see his his inner truth, his inner good self. <laughs> Yeah, well, which I actually have an opinion on that or a thought on that, actually, you know, <laughs> after he sees himself it, or he, yeah, he sees like a child version of himself yep. and then helps the child by like his hat, you know, his his head is hot and he needs a cat. Yeah, like, my head is so hot. <laughs> yeah, and he's like, everyone deserves a hat. But it's funny. It's like the thing that helps him. I mean, if we want to be technical, he technically helped himself. <laughs> <laughs> He's very, yeah, he's very righteous and very, uh, what is it, self-centered. <laughs> yeah, right. it, it took helping someone that was literally him, just, you know, mirror version of him, um, <laughs> to actually be generous. So was he really generous? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it breaks the curse. And yeah. uh, I don't know, did I have any other little notes I was thinking? Oh, the, the um, because it was raining on him, I guess he got all like... <laughs> Moldy and he was growing mushrooms. I thought that was yeah. kind of worse. <laughs> that was, that was and he's trying to shove him in Mariel's mouth. <laughs> like the apple in the pig mouth. It was just like oh, yeah. oh man. But yeah, so I mean we got we get a little more horror with this one, especially with like the monster hallucinations. We get the curse, right? So we're sort of back into interesting that like season two sort of started off not horror and then yeah. sort of went into a little more like horror themes. Um, yeah, but overall, I really I like this one too. Yeah, this was a fun one. I had a lot of fun with this one, and then this was one that I think actually I remembered. Like as I was watching it too, I was like, I remembered this and the one we're going to talk about next. I actually remembered these two, oh, so I was yeah. like, oh, this was fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me see if I had any. I feel like I had some fun facts with this one. Um. The uh, the guy with the long hair in the movie theater. Uh, this is actually his second appearance. First one, he was in Freaky Fred. Um, oh, yeah, because he cut his hair, right? He cut his hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is one of Freaky Fred's victims. This is in the movie theater. Um, and then the title card uh, uses the is a, is a repeated drawing from Cat's Motel. Nice. Um, so little Easter eggs here and there. Yeah. Oh yeah, we always love those. <laughs> Our next oh, right. segment, Steve, would you like to introduce it? Yeah, episode two, or no, yeah, episode two, segment one, right? Um, episode two, yeah. We just did two, the Shirley one. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, courage in the big stinking city. Funny that I'm reading this one, being from New York. Um, yeah, perfect. So courage, <laughs> yeah, this, I think this is also the first time we we go to an actual place. Yeah, like a real. Yeah, this is like an a, actual city. A real place. Legitimate. Yeah. Like, real place, not, like, made up. <laughs> so Courage and his owners go to New York City for Muriel to perform at Radio City Music Hall in Rockefeller Center. A giant mm -hmm. cockroach named Schwick, short for Bushwick, which is a place in Brooklyn, for those that don't know, <laughs> um, offer, offers to let them stay at his place until the show. Schwick forces Courage to fetch an evil package for him, where he will release his deadly pet to devour Muriel. Um, what did you think of this one? I thought this one was really fun because this one was like it had it was also they kept it very gritty, like dark, seedy, mm -hmm. back alley, New York style. Like they really wanted to go for a specific tone in this episode yeah. and they tried to nail it down. And the, and helping that is Bushwick, of course. Or we can't say that right. His name is Schwick, not Schwick. Bushwick. <laughs> yeah, Just don't call, Schwick. Don't call me Bushwick. <laughs> <laughs> Um, how yeah, did no, you feel was... about going to New York City for especially from being from New York? How did you feel about this episode? Yeah, I mean, I guess pretty <laughs> accurate. <laughs> it's um, pretty close. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, it was funny that they ended up, you know, they, like she she wins this contest to play the sitar in Radio City Music Hall. So, of course, you know, we get a Rockettes reference. We get all of that. Um, taxi ride, subway, you know, we get all this sort of these just, you know, your classic New York tropes, right? Um, yeah. r- rude people walking in the streets, you know, you get your typical, <laughs> hey, I'm walking here kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, which, you know. <laughs> We're not all that rude, yeah, but you know, we can be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I mean, I thought, yeah, I loved Bushwick as a character, Schwick, um, who is mm. from Bushwick. <laughs> <laughs> you could hear the accent. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I do love it. I mean, you know, we got actual shout out to, to Brooklyn. Um, but yeah, no, I thought this was fun. This one, um, again, going a little bit more into the horror, like you said, it, you know, where they end up was almost like a saw trap. Or it looked like it would be in a jigsaw sort of scenario, right? The, the, how dirty yeah. that room was with the chains and <laughs> um, very well drawn. I liked it. Oh, yeah, it was very yeah. detailed. And I believe this is the one that we had some scenes on the TV, right? And this one, this is the one where we had movie scenes on the TV. So there were a couple of clips on the TV. I don't remember seeing movies, but where we got some really cool um, stuff was in the... Um, when he's going through the building, like the hell building. Um, oh, yes. Looking for the package, he opens the doors. And then in one door is Ghidorah. Yeah, Ghidorah, yeah. I remember um, that. And was then it? in the other door, I think, oh, yeah, we had a, we had a shark. It wasn't a clip from Jaws or anything. It was just but it a, was a shark. Yeah, shark underwater. <laughs> um, and then we had, <laughs> so my description for this, the, the, the person playing the violin, it was like Lady Gaga meets Large Marge. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this character so it, is actually in the intro i believe right to the season two now you see her on the intro thing yes yeah i mean i just love it so yeah when you you know he opens and you see the girl from the back and it's like this this long blonde hair um but it looked like one of gaga's wigs from like her first couple of albums um i think like <laughs> poker face she had that hair and then when she turns around it was like that claymation kind of large mark very thing. animated yeah <laughs> I loved it. I, I, I thought it was really funny. Um, and then uh, we also get Things I Do for Love makes a comeback in this one. Yeah, first time for season two. First time for season two. We get it, we get his catchphrase. Um, yeah, I mean, other like, I really love the stuff on the subway. And that was great. Thing. Yeah, that that kind of the creepy guy sitting next to him that's just drooling. Like, the, the just giraffe. Sleeping or, <laughs> the, just drooling. <really. laughs> And then our cop who's looking for the evil package and like courage is trying to dodge him the whole time. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> this cop I mean, he uses, I mean, it's such a cliche joke, but he uses like a donut to like lure the cop away. I was like, the donut's such an old gag. Oh, so like, stereotypical. <laughs> it works. It's funny, you know. Um but uh and then the yeah, so the use the conductor runs away. Yeah, the everyone... conductor jumps out or something jumps like that, out. and then it's a runaway train, and then the cop just stands there like screaming, and then really? Courage jumps out too, but then decides to go back into the train to stop. The... <laughs> I just, I, I also found it funny that the train was an automated nuclear powered subway. <laughs> oh yeah, and it was like it was a speed train or something. It was a bullet it was a, train. It was an automated <laughs> nuclear powered bullet train, which I don't think you have to live in New York to know that those don't exist here. <laughs> <laughs> But that was and at funny. that time, wow, I don't even think well, maybe that might have been a concept at the time in Japan where they were thinking of this. But yeah, it was kind of funny that they came up with this thing for the show. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, we're going to throw that in New York for, you know, raise the stakes a little bit. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I thought it was funny. The uh, there's another funny gag because, you no, know, it's fine because this was also probably written in the 90s. Yeah, I know. I think this episode came out in like 2000, um, but it was probably written in the 90s. Uh, they they did a crack at the whole boxers versus briefs yep. uh, debate <laughs> of the nineties. Um, that was fantastic. Yeah, so the roach wanted boxers. Eustace was like briefs. <laughs> yeah, and he just like tears his skin, like the roach tears himself apart. He's like boxers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so topical for the time. Um, that was yeah. a running thing that people were asked, which is so weird now to think about, but. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah but yeah no but overall i enjoyed this one i know they the, so the train crashes in radio uh city music hall muriel gets to perform 
Yeah. Um, and then the cop uh, joins the Rockettes and they take the roach in. Take the roach. <laughs> and Eustace ends up getting the skin and all that devoured by our monster that we never get to see, though. We don't get to see this creature, though. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. The creature is hidden. Um, Which yeah, is cool. Another... Leave a little mystery to the eye. You know, sure. That's kind of cool. <laughs> Less is more. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, yeah. And then another downer ending for Eustace. <laughs> <laughs> So this is overall a great episode, huh? But it was a good episode, yeah. Definitely. So now we're on to episode three, our first segment of episode three, right? Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to be talking about now family business. A burglar breaks into the farmhouse and attacks Courage and his owners, gaining their complicity or yeah, their complicity against their will. However, he suffers from multiple personality disorder and claims to be a relative and his attitude towards them changes. So, <laughs> this was definitely a heavy comedy episode for sure. <laughs> this was a funny one. Um, yeah, I like this one. What'd you think? I thought the burglar, like, yeah, he just, he was such a weird avant-garde character that you, at first I didn't really like him, but then as the episode went on, it was like it grew on you. Even in that short period of time, on just a short segment, it was kind of like in those few minutes, he won me over, you know? <laughs> yeah, and I, I thought that he was actually going to turn out to be family, because Muriel and Eustace have some pretty weird family members. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. You know? Yeah, that's what I was like. <laughs> you know, I was going to say, maybe this really is their cousin Basil. Um, but I, lo I love that name, Basil. Uh, yeah. Basil, Basil Forte. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> um, and then what was it cousin? Um, what do you think uh, Courage's name was? It was um, Nigel. Oh, the names for Nigel. Yeah, he kept calling him Nige, Nigel. Nigel. <laughs> um, but yeah, he uh, steals a fish from the fridge, right? Uh, and then he wants to, to have family everybody. dinner with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he wants to have dinner with them too. Yeah, yeah, that's the whole big thing. Is like he just wants sort of wants family, which is really the crux of the the character. Yeah, and he's what being chased by who? What does he keep calling him? Not the police. He keeps calling him something else, and he's being chased by like you know. Um, I forgot what his reference was, but he kept saying like a different like word for the name. Which was like, why does he have park rangers on his tail? Yeah, park rangers. That's what he kept saying. He's like, the park rangers will be after me. I was like, <laughs> what do you, what do you, yeah, like, where, you know, what, how do they get involved in burglars? I, you know, in burglar cases. <laughs> uh, I guess where they end up, it would make sense for them to get involved, right? Um, yeah. But, you know, but first, obviously, we have this big, like, dinner scene where he keeps trying to get Muriel to guess, like, her special dish. And she has no idea what the hell is her special dish, you know, what it's supposed to be. Yeah, I love her at when she comes out. She's like, "You can you give me at least a little hint? <laughs> mm -hmm. And Cardi uses Morse code to, like, <laughs> signal it. Um, yeah, so it's not mashed potatoes. It's not ham. It was... Um, it was just fish, right? It was, like, flounder or something. Yeah, it was, like, a flounder. Yeah, it was a certain fish just cooked, yeah. And then, obviously, Basil's not well. He, like, debones the fish, and inside the bones is the plans. Yeah, he's always just, like, our typical ones are the plans for the next heist. <laughs> yeah. And then they end up... Um... Oh, yeah, so the yeah, so the so Carge tries to tell the cops, the park rangers, that he's inside, and they don't understand him. Um, which I guess this is, again, further confirmation that Muriel, I think, is the only one that understands Courage on the show. Yeah, like that's true. Yeah, as far as we know, like that actually knows what he's talking about. Yeah, because she, like, obviously through the Morse code, knows what he's talking about just that way. And I think she understands him even when he's doing his crazy, like, animation stuff. <laughs> his babbling and his, like, charades. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, and they end up at Mount Rushmore because now that, that's yes. a big heist. He wants the family business, is they're going to take all the heads off of Mount Rushmore. <laughs> that was cute when they were trying to, like, they're the officers were trying to pick him out of the nose when Basil crawled up into the nose and they're using like the giant finger. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So they do the finger gag with the nose and then they do courage has Q-tips for the ears. I know that was gross when he came out and he was covered in earwax. I was like, Ugh, yeah. man, no. the show no. does gross pretty well. <laughs> yeah. The sound effects, like when they do specific colors and sound effects, they just nail it. Right. <laughs> Yeah, just all the Foley sounds, right? All the squishy stuff and all the... I mean, the, even the, just down to the coloring and the... I mean, it is like... They, 
they're really good at doing gross. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but this is sort of another episode, right? Where it comes down to giving the villain what, like, their truth is, right? Like, what their true desire is. And for him, it's family. Yeah. And or, I like know. how Muriel's very, very open to help him. You know what I mean? She, like, tells Courage, like, we got to help Basil. You know, like, he's part of, like, he is part of us now. <laughs> In a weird way. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, so, you know, it's really sweet, um, and, you know, and I, you know, I, obviously, they don't go too heavy with the metaphors here, but I, you know, I always, I, I always think, like, what's going on for the writers, like, what, what's sort of, like, what are they trying to get across, and it's like, um, you know, a lot of people who struggle or whatever, or like, make poor choices, all these things, right, it's all about, like, having resources and supports and having people in your corner, right, so it's like, to get him on the right path, he just sort of needed opportunities and people that care for him and all this sort of stuff, you know. So it's a very simple, but it's like very sweet, effective message, right? Yeah, so it was cool. This one was a very cute, like fun one that is has a good message. And like you said, it's co good comedy and you can show this to people. And I think they would have a lot of fun with this one, even the kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so segment two um a thousand years of courage uh <laughs> this, is a, this is a long synopsis here <laughs> yeah you always get the long ones steve steve always does the long ones for us <laughs> um so due to a meteor impacting the planet courage and his owners are hurled a thousand years into the future inhabited by banana people they follow the banana people to a castle called banana hala um where supposedly everyone's question is answered um Unknown to them, the castle is a trap in which a giant gorilla feeds on the unsuspecting banana people entering it. Courage must save his owners and the banana people from the giant gorilla. <laughs> <laughs> banana hollow. <laughs> I love that. Wild concept. Um, so it uh, so the episode starts actually with them playing bingo. Um, and I thought that the numbers that they did you catch all the numbers that they were calling? No, I didn't catch the numbers. I did catch that we did get a date for this episode, though. So we'll talk about that later in a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So um, just as a little, like, nothing too deep. It was just a little funny gag where I think it was, like, the second and third number that Eustace calls is actually TV ratings. So it was, he called, it was, uh, you know, B something. And then it was, I think it was PU2, like you stink. Um, and then it was TV14. And then it was nice. NC seventeen. <laughs> NC seventeen. <laughs> where the where the other numbers that he called out. So I thought that was just kind of a funny little thing. Like a kid's Cute. not gonna know what the rating system is, but fun little joke oh, just to throw in. Um because that was that's kind of a big deal because for horror movies that, that was the MPA that was a big deal, you know, in the eighties and nineties of trying to get our ratings or not get nc-17 ratings so it was a big deal back then <laughs> yeah yeah you know pushing the envelope but now it's, it's so funny because now we're sort of at a point where so many of the things that maybe go out on streaming that aren't rated could probably get an nc-17 but now we don't have to worry about movies <laughs> you know we don't have to worry about <laughs> yeah. um theater you know as much uh yeah. if something's gonna go right to streaming that like they don't have to worry so much about stuff <laughs> yeah that's why we got shows like Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, or anything by what's his name? Um, Lars von Trier. Lars von Trier. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He's out there. <laughs> he's out there. There's some, you know, a lot of wild things he's done. Uh, but anywho, fun little joke. I liked it. But this, what did you think of this whole concept of uh, or sentient banana people? <laughs> This one was out there. This one kind of gave me Planet of the Apes vibes. I got yeah. very softcore Planet of the Apes vibes with it a little bit. And I love the fact that, like I said, this one dates the show. So we're in 2001. As of the beginning yeah. of this episode, that's where they're at because they get pushed to 3001. And Muriel says, we are we got pushed a thousand years into the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, so we are 2001, um, which I think is a year after the airing of this episode yeah so they're a little bit in the future with the actual show because this yeah, one yeah, i yeah. think like you said came out in 2000 <clears throat> i think let me double check actually a thousand years of courage aired in yeah 2000 december of 2000 so it was just it was about pretty close it was really close it was yeah it was on the cusp there um <laughs> but yeah no i you know i really thought this one it's funny when you say planet of the apes too given that the um the threat at the end is like a gorilla. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. uh, just munching down some bananas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It uh so the funny gag I liked in this one was um the like the 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 the, the shady banana, the one that like sold them the oh yeah, banana. the one with the coat with the trench coat, yeah. <laughs> First, I thought it was gonna flash them like the grum, like the flashing gremlin. Um, yep. <laughs> I was like, "Oh no, are, I, are we gonna go there?" No, uh, <laughs> but but it was funny. Um, and I, you know, they fit in. It was like the little gag in the the bathroom. He didn't know which bathroom to go into because there were just two bananas, and I guess it was supposed to be boy banana, girl banana. But you know, yeah, you're just like, what? You don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Almost um, like the three seashell thing. <laughs> but yeah, but it was fun though. I um is there some little uh little thing? So there's some music that get shared. So um Chicken from Outer Space, um and this one share well they they're the only ones that do two different there's different music for the credits. So there's like a song at the end, um, instead of the typical end credits. Yeah. Song. Um, <clears throat> there's similar mute, and then it shares a score with King Ramses. That's cool. So fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and then what was the other one? There is. Oh yeah, and it uses um Indian theme music, um sampled from. I'm gonna butcher this name. Uh, Stan. Oh, I guess it's Stan Leopards and Carta, Virtual Globe, 1998, Virtual Flights. I, I guess it was like a, 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 like a virtual, almost like a Google Earth kind of thing. Okay, <laughs> it took music from that for some reason. I guess very pop were... culture, very deep pop culture reference right there. <laughs> I mean, anyone ever used the the Encarta Virtual Globe from 1998? <laughs> Shout us out in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> that old virtual simulator. Um, but yeah, no, but this was a fun one. Well, you know, funny enough, so if we talk about messages, we're talking about themes, we're talking about things like that. So like this is I this idea of like um a false prophet, this like false religion, this kind of like yeah. you know, they're sort of easily swayed um by this gorilla who is like sort of uh you know the, the the promise of banana holla, right? Yeah, uh, and they find out that it was sort of all a ruse, and um, I guess sort of be careful, you know, and yeah, with what you what you, you know, believe in, what you choose to follow. Yeah, <laughs> for real. And this one, like I said, also has just I think it's just sci fi. Like I didn't get too much horror vibes. It's very sci fi ish because we got the Planet of the Apes reference. Also, Logan's Run. It has like a Logan's Run type feel to it as well. Right. Right. Yeah, so we really didn't. Yeah, not a lot of horror in these first few episodes of the season. I know, I'm sure it's coming. Um, yeah, but they definitely are trying different corners of the genre. Oh yeah, for sure. They're trying to touch all aspects, and again, bringing in a lot of kind of creative characters and the villains. I think are becoming more stylish, you know, and more creative. Definitely for sure. Yeah. Oh, you know, fun fact, actually, there was uh, one of the movies that got referenced in season one just went on Shudder. Nice. It was one of the movies that I think Muriel was watching on the TV. Um, was it, was was it the Wearmole it? episode? It was the, in the, yeah, the Wearmole episode where they showed like a couple of B movies. Yeah, it was when she saw this is one of my favorite programs. Yeah. Yes. One the first one one of them is in, is on Shutter right now. Nice. Yeah, I'm blanking <laughs> on the name, of it, but I saw the the title. I was like, oh wait, that's from the episode. <laughs> so I love that. But yeah, no. But overall, and I think that thing at the end. So when they go back to the past, right? That creature that hits the asteroid or the meteor. Yeah, he baseball. Yeah, he baseballs it. Um, I think we've seen that creature before, right? That one I don't remember. I can't remember. Maybe as a like courage turning into something. He might have been like one of courage's like transformations, maybe. Yeah, okay, yeah. This is the space dino. I just clicked it. Nice. Um so the space the space dino was in the Duck Brothers episode. 
The Duck Brother. Okay, cool. Um, as Alien Species Five Five Nine, um, the the Alien Dino appears in three one episode in season one, three episodes in season two, and one episode of season four. Sweet. <laughs> So, a little so it's going to be a running gag. He'll be a running gag. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, which I, which is pretty fun. So yeah, it's right. a lot of fun talking season two, man. This is really cool diving into. It. I hope all of you are enjoying this because yeah, like this, a lot of different flavors. Like we said with season two, it's there are a lot of more. You can tell money because of animation style details and CGI. There's a lot more going on in these first three episodes, and just very different flavors. So it's been a lot of fun. Thank you, Steve, for joining me. Anything you want to plug or anything you want to talk about for voices that's coming up that you want to mention before we head out. Yeah, I mean, just check us back over at Voices from the Mausoleum. Uh, we have a lot of cool stuff coming your way. Some interviews from um, some found footage films that we've covered recently. We've got some actors, some uh, filmmakers coming, uh, more author interviews. Cool. Uh, Norrin is going to be joining me for Coffee Breaks. Uh, yeah. They're going to be the in-between episodes for the Coffee Crypt. Uh, we're going to be doing a few side stories, things that either we you know, couldn't cover on the main show, things that maybe we want to do a little bit deeper dives on um, in between episodes. So really fun stuff. Um, some new shows coming out we're planning, so can't reveal too much yet. Uh, new genre-based shows, um, new discussion shows. So yeah, so come follow us, join us. Always a lot of fun content over there. Like you said, it's it's great that you and Angel always pumping out and keeping the horror alive for us people. You know what I mean? We love it. We love it. Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> you too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did too. yeah, that's true. That's true. We're always we always got to stay going, you know, because for us, Halloween, it's pretty much a lifelong thing. You know, this is something that's in our blood. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So thanks for sticking around with us, y'all. And if you want to stream these episodes, we are on HBO Max. That's where we, are, where we are watching these, and that's the episode list that we're going with. And thanks for sticking around with us, y'all. And hope you all have a safe and happy day. Peace out.